everybody. So our next lesson is all about how to overcome the feeling of being so overwhelmed through online health literacy. So I'm gonna explain to you what that is. Um, and just first of all, I wanna also say that we are also going to talk a lot about overwhelm and stress management in units six and seven. So, but this is the foundational section where we're gonna talk about all these kind of basic foundational skills you need just to start off your journey as a patient. So um, we're gonna talk about my best five tips. And at the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, a journal activity and a toolbox activity for you. So I'm excited about this. So what is health literacy? Uh, according to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, it's the skills that you use to make sense of health information. In terms of you know, now being an adult with a rheumatic disease like rheumatoid arthritis, you now have to, as part of your job as a patient, you know, I love to use the metaphor throughout this course of being diagnosed with something like rheumatoid arthritis is like getting a new job. Your new job is to learn how to manage your rheumatoid arthritis on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And the whole reason I developed this course, just to reiterate what I said in the welcome module, is that you need an orientation to a job, right? When you start a new job, they don't just throw you in and say, okay, just do everything. You normally get like an orientation process where they explain, okay, here's where the things are and this is how you do things. And so um, that's really my big motivation in developing this was basically like giving people that orientation, that guide so that they can then take it and run with it. So, um, so again, knowing about medical information is a part of that job description. My first tip is going to be, you know, finding trustworthy sources of information, which sounds obvious, but it is very, very common in the beginning to go down a lot of what I call rabbit holes, which means like you start on one website, like you start with the valid website and then you keep clicking and clicking and clicking and pretty soon you're on something that's like way off the rails in terms of validity. So when you look at information about your disease, you want to first look, does the author of the website or article or book, do they have any training or evidence for actually being the expert they claim to be? Now, this is not to say that let's, um, you know, anecdotes have no place, right? Um, for example, it's very powerful as a patient to connect to other patients' personal stories so you don't feel so alone. I love looking at blogs and um, learning from other patient experiences, but if you're looking at, like, really looking for medical information, make sure that there is either the author of the article has some training or they cite evidence in their article or that it's part of an overall organization that will um, make sure that what's posted is valid. So like Healthline or Everyday Health are sites where they do feature patient stories, but they have a whole journalistic team that goes through and makes sure that, this, that the information that's presented in that article is valid. As a general rule of thumb, sites that end in like .edu, .gov, and .org tend to have higher standards in verifying information. That's not to say ones that end in .com don't ever. It's just a really simple um, starting point for you. An example would be like Harvard Health Publishing has a really great article about RA, and that's a .edu website. National Institute of Health is a .gov in the US, and then Arthritis Foundation, arthritisfoundation.org. And um, I'm just putting in here, which those of you who purchase the course, you're gonna have um, the full hand, set of handouts from the presentations in addition to the, um, the journal slash toolkit workbook. The little links here are just some of the valid information that I've found. So again, Arthritis Foundation, American College of Rheumatology, which is the professional organization for rheumatologists who are the doctors that work on these diseases, right? And um, their website's really great. Creaky Joints, IFAA, which is started by a patient. Oh, Creaky Joints was as well. Those are both nonprofits. A National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Skin Diseases. You, know, you don't need me to read these all to you, but just know that this is a, a starting point for you. Um, depending on what you're interested in. If you're interested in the complementary and alternative or integrative health, that's definitely something a lot of people want to go find more information about. You can check out you know, a valid source for that. So a few books that I th think are, are well 
um, edited and well verified uh, the first year of rheumatoid arthritis, living with rheumatoid arthritis, and then I really like surviving and thriving with an invisible chronic illness. Um, she's really down to earth, the author, and it's, just, it's entertaining as well as helpful. And then living a healthy life with chronic pain, that's from the Stanford University and the Center for uh, Self-Management. Okay, so the next tip is one of the most important, and it's actually why I decided to make this a free preview lesson for the course because I think it's so, so important, which is to use social media wisely. So there are so many amazing benefits to social media. I mean, I think I've met a lot of you most likely through social media. Um, and so um, sometimes there can be this impression that, oh, well, people shouldn't use social media ever for anything to do with their disease. Now, that's totally unrealistic. But I want to make sure that when you use social media, you do it like in a savvy wise way when you're specifically in the mindset of I'm seeking information about my health care and my health management. So, okay, there are a lot of studies actually, believe it or not, um, about the effects of social media and how on patients and how patients are using social media. So there are a lot of benefits and I'm, I'm glad that the studies are looking at the benefits as well, which are first of all, just improved access to health information. So with social media, we have so many more you know, sites, blogs, ways to um, access information. The second one is connections to other patients. So, you know, having peer support is so important and empowering and healthcare providers have known that for a long time. That's why there's been peer support groups for conditions back, you know, decades back, right? So that now it can just happen a lot more informally on social media, which is you know, on your own time, it's convenient. You know, there's so many good things about social media. Um, and there's also, you know, peer support for quote unquote healthy behaviors from a public health standpoint. But the thing that we have to think about is there are downsides. There just are, right? And I, I like to think of social media as like, it's just like a big waiting room in the sense of like, okay, when you physically, when you go to the doctor, you sit in a waiting room, right? And sometimes, you know, people strike up conversations with each other in the waiting room and you have something in common. You're both going to the same kind of doctor. But, um, but the, the dangers can be that there's a lack of quality control of the information. So any random person that you're talking to, like let's say in the waiting room of your rheumatologist office, you know, they could be getting their information from a super unreliable source, right? From somebody who is just trying to sell them like a supplement that they're saying is going to cure arthritis, which is not shown to be effective, right? So that's really the main downside. Um, also, it, really a tendency to overemphasize anecdotes at the expense of understanding the greater trends. What I mean by that, or what the study means by that as well, is you know, anecdotes are just personal stories. And now everything's a double-edged sword, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna use the metaphor of a double-edged sword many, many times here in this course, but um, double-edged sword means like it has a good and it has a bad. So anecdotes, personal stories are extremely powerful, right? There's so many people who have commented to me or I've commented on their stories saying, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one or, you know, humans connect to each other through storytelling, which is awesome. But if you look at one anecdote, once you look at one personal story, it kind of sticks to your mind in a deeper way due to just how our brains are wired than, on, than like a greater trend. Like if you read, okay, 70% of people respond well to drug therapy for rheumatoid arthritis. It's like kind of like 70%. That's kind of vague, right? But if one person writes a blog post all about how terrible methotrexate was for them, that's like sticky, right? That's like, ooh, oh no, methotrexate. Like methotrexate is bad. You know, so there's a, there's, um, a lack of kind of understanding what does one person's story mean in the greater context, okay? And then there's also a vulnerability for patients to hidden conflicts of interest, which just means somebody might be trying to just seem like they're neutral, a neutral party, when really they're actually trying to, you know, um, get you to buy their product. So this is, I put the citation on the bottom as well as the hyperlink, which is the, it's from the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Journal. And so my favorite way to approach this is to think about what does representativeness mean in statistics, okay? So in statistics, representative means that the example you're looking at is typical or similar to what you're wanting to study. So in this case, you are most likely wanting to study yourself, right? You wanna know, is this, what is what worked for someone else going to work for me? 
aka my doctor puts me on a new medicine. This is a common one because I see it every single day on social media. Again, not that it's good or bad. This is just what happens. Then my doctor wants me to go on X medicine. Who's been on X medicine before? What did you think? Did it work for you or did it not? Very human nature to want to ask that. And it's not a bad question to want to ask. But you have to understand when you ask that and you look at the answers, you have to understand that you need to know whether the people who respond to that question are representative of you. So representativeness means, um, in this case, for example, let's say you in 2020 were diagnosed with RA and your doctor put you on a medicine. If you go into a social media group and you ask, how do people like this medicine? Somebody who is, who comments in that group, who was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, like in 1970, who had severe joint deformities is not going to be representative of what you diagnosed recently will be projected to experience. The representative person would be somebody with similar characteristics as you. So things like similar age, similar severity of RA, similar diagnosis, similar comorbidities, severity, again, oh, I said severity twice, blood work, you know, doctor's prognosis. Those are super, super important. And I don't think that all patients understand that, um, which is why I'm making this training free, by the way. Um, one of the many reasons. Since you don't know that person's medical history, it's not, again, a bad thing to want to just get general ideas and general support from other people, but be careful to, quote unquote, overgeneralize from that, meaning, okay, well, because it happened to them, it will happen to me. Um, you know, when I went on Enbrel and I was in Medicaid remission for the first five years of my disease, I didn't go in any groups and not even, well, first they didn't exist, but by, you know, 2007, after I'd been, had it for five or 2008, when I'd had it for five years, they did exist, but I didn't go on any groups because I was doing great and I didn't really need to process it other than I just take my Enbrel every week. So, you know, that's actually, that leads to the next question or the next idea, which is, um, Again, understanding, so this was understanding representativeness on the individual level, okay? But then you also wanna look at representativeness at the group level, which means overall, the people who are the loudest on the groups or the most active may or may not be representative of the average person with your disease. So for example, the restaurant reviews, right? People who write the restaurant reviews are usually like really, 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 really happy or really, 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 really unhappy, right? And so if someone's, in medicated remission, which many, many people are. There are many people in medicated remission running around like I was the first five years on Enbrel. I'm not, this is not a, this, I shouldn't have said Enbrel actually, um, but the, my first medication, um, are they gonna be posting a lot in groups? Probably not, right? It's almost like they can be, they can be a silent majority, okay? So 70% of people respond well to drug therapy and 30% do not. Like there's, the citation for that is within this US News and World Report article. So, you know, under that is why sometimes doctors get frustrated when patients are like, well, I'm so scared to take the medicines because of what I heard on social media, because the doctors are actually seeing those 70% of the people all the time. You know, I have to ask myself, are the people on social media more representative of those 30% that aren't getting better with medicines or are they more representative of the 70% which is logically the majority who are doing somewhat well on drugs, okay? So again, that's just the actual facts at this point. So really think about that when you go onto social media and just try to be as savvy as possible. Um, you know, look for how the groups are moderated for the quality of information. Some are moderated really heavily, some are not, they're like a free for all. And just monitor yourself for your overwhelm and overload, you know, use it for what's best for you. My general rule of thumb for me personally is I use social media for the social support and in peer to peer connections, but I really talk to my doctor and use the more valid sources for the hardcore medical information. Um, I'm gonna go a little quicker through the end. I'm getting excited here, rambling as per usual, but um, three is simply timing. So timing when you look up information about your disease. So make sure you're in a good mental place to be able to handle potentially like difficult information. For me personally, an example would be like late at night is not the best time for me to look up kind of the horror stories or the worst case scenarios. I have to kind of make sure I'm in a good mental place to do that. The fourth tip is to balance skepticism with open-mindedness. So this is going a little bit back to what we're talking about with tip two. So in general, you know, there are no known cures for RA that are going to work for everyone. That doesn't mean that one person in one context who tried a diet and it worked for them, it doesn't mean that that's invalid. It just means that 
there is no overall cure that is going to actually make the disease go away for everyone. Okay, so that's the citation on the NHS. There, you'll find it on every valid website. There is no actual cure for RA at this time. However, um, I kind of see in my life, I guess I can just share that I've really had to balance the skepticism part, which is like, okay, I'm going to be realistic about this with the open mindedness because, um, just an example in general, logically, lack of evidence for something is not itself evidence of a lack. And actually, those of us who went through a period of misdiagnosis or being told you're not actually sick are very aware of this, right? So they, for example, in my case, there was no evidence that I was sick at first. <laughs> the tests that they did, they didn't do any tests that looked at RA. So they were like, you're fine, you're not sick. So there was no quote unquote evidence that I was sick. But actually, that itself wasn't evidence that I wasn't sick because I actually did have RA. They just didn't do the right tests at that time. So in terms of um, looking at therapies and treatments and should I try this, should I try that? So there's this really kind of tenuous or difficult like cost benefit analysis. And it's very specific to each of the different, um, each of the different kinds of treatments you might be thinking about outside of the traditional Western medicine. You might be looking at, okay, well, should I try a diet? Should I try, you know, a supplement? And, um, you know, this is a longer conversation we're going to talk about more in units three and four. But basically, there are so many unknowns that at the end of the day, it is really like you're in the driver's seat of your health care. You're, you're the one that at the end of the day is affected. So you get to make the best decision for you. Evidence is, is a, a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum of evidence. There's certain things that have been studied for years and years and years, other things that haven't. So you, at the end of the day, let's just summarize, have to find the balance that works the best for you, okay? So going back, zooming back to the big picture, you know, think about, I want you to open your workbook and your journal um, or just ponder on your own if you don't want to take the time to do it. You know, do you feel like you have a good set of valid resources to go to for information about RA? And if not, um, you know, what information are you most confused about and maybe put together a list of questions for your doctor or research on your own and bring them to your next appointment to try to like start developing that health literacy and that empowerment. And of course, you know, that's one of the reasons I developed this course and created it from scratch is that I want you to have a valid source of information to go back to again and again. And now that I've been doing it since April 2020, you know, I've had people say, wow, I just reviewed you know, the information from this unit or that unit. And it's been really, really amazing. So I really am, am grateful for that. And I do, I do have evidence and citations throughout, the, you know, this whole um, course. And we, I also want you to, oops, there's my, my little bubbles in the way, but um, add a few websites or books or other sources to the CEO section of your toolbox. So the toolbox, just as a reminder, is your at a glance two page list of what are your biggest tools that you're going to be using to in the different um, areas of your management of RA. So uh, you have CEO skills, like you have the CEO of your care team. So that includes things like medical information and advocacy and then organization. That's also underneath CEO skills. Um, and then we have our social tools, which we're going to talk about more in, we, in units seven and eight and meaning and joy, you know, how can you still have a meaningful, joyful existence despite RA? And we have our body tools and our mind tools and our life hacks. So, um, so I'm really looking forward to developing these toolboxes with you all. But that's that for this lesson. So bye bye for now.